Great, great. So one of the things that I wanted to uh, start with is I realized that actually, you know, so far, nobody has actually talked about what quantum machine learning actually is. <laughs> so I figured, you know, because we've got, again, because we've got a broad audience, I may as well throw in some slides to talk about basically what I, what I think deep down really uh, it is. And first, before getting into that, we really should talk about what you know, machine learning actually really boils down to. So basically, the fundamental thing about, about this is that with machine learning, what we want to do is we want to be able to design algorithms such that we don't explicitly tell the algorithms how to solve problems. We get them to solve problems, typically problems in classification or in, in the case of reinforcement learning in terms of some planning type problem by feeding it examples of, uh, of actions that, you know, or typical examples of things. And then based on the training vectors that have been provided to it, get it to learn how it should compute. So rather than giving it a prescription, what we do is we teach it how to learn and then give it the data that we need in order to be able to, to do things. And so, you know, there's a bunch of different, different types of this. And the, the first talk uh, that we went into kind of talked about the broad taxonomy of this. Much of machine learning uh, falls into a, uh, several different camps. The first is supervised learning. And, you know, for supervised learning, this is like the simplest thing that most of you kind of probably think about when it comes to machine learning. What you have is say you wanted to train a computer to be able to read numbers. What you would do is you'd get, say, a list of uh, hand, handwritten numbers, like these from the MNIST uh, data set over here. And then each of these, if each of these comes with a label that is given by an expert who knows how to read numbers, ideally. Actually, if you take a look at the MNIST data set, I, I'm not sure I would get 100% if I was reading this thing. Some of those numbers are pretty gnarly to read. But in any case, you have a, an expert who's gone through and uh, told what these things are ideally supposed to be. and what you want to do is you want to be able to build a piece of software such that you can reproduce the correlations between this. So for example, you feed in a vector, this four over here, and ideally you want the computer to be able to pop out the label. But one of the key things, of course, about this is it isn't just about precisely reproducing the statistics in the training set that's fed in. You really want these things to ideally generalize. So you want to be able to detect the pattern, not memorize the pattern. It's like you know, learning physics. You want to be able to learn the pattern of how to solve physical problems, not memorize an equation sheet. And so that's, that's sort of what's going on here. The next kind of big class of, uh, of algorithms in this space are, of course, unsupervised algorithms. So, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like you, you can always say for any field that there's always two classes of things, you know, x and not x. And this is sort of that type of a taxonomy here. And the idea basically is that with supervised learning, you had these gold standard labels associated with the training examples. With this over here, you don't. So examples of this, a classic one, is clustering. So if you have this data over here, you might ask, OK, I'd like to know, you know whether or not all of these data points over here are you know, typical of a single distribution or if they're typical, say, of three distributions coming in. And so you can do this by clustering the data using an algorithm like k-means clustering, which would give this result over here. So that's an example of unsupervised, again, because of the fact that there's no labels involved. The final one, which was mentioned in great detail on Monday, is reinforcement learning. And the idea basically behind this is that what you want to do is you want to be able to come up with a policy, i.e., a set of decisions about how to make moves in some, inside some sort of a game. And reinforcement learning, it often ends up using ideas mostly from supervised learning in order to be able to come up with rules for figuring out what the current, generalizing what the current situation is and then figuring out how it should respond. And this, of course, has led to great successes in things like automated Go playing. So, now, what's quantum machine learning? Now, quantum machine learning, you might think, OK, well, you know, quantum machine learning is the natural evolution of uh, machine learning because, well, you know, machine learning has hype, quantum has hype. You put them together, you have hype squared, which equals at least grant squared, right? So, but with quantum machine learning, I think there's some interesting things that, that end up uh, uh, coming down. Obviously, the most natural one that, that come, comes up is we really would like to look in a field that has the potential of giving new applications of, of uh, quantum computing. And this is cool because, hey, not only does this give new communities that we can reach out to, learn things uh, from, and also have an impact on, 
but it also, you know, really does actually, I think, in some ways, cause us to really push the boundaries of how we approach problems. For example, with the techniques that Rolando was talking about yesterday, there are many ideas that were, you know, I, I, I developed for the problem of solving linear systems of equations that ended up proving to be more valuable broadly. By looking at new problems, we find new solutions, and everybody benefits from that. So the next thing, of course, in, in, in quantum machine learning that, that we hope to do isn't just take a look at ordinary machine learning problems and make them solve things better. There's actually new things that we can do in quantum machine learning. We can come up with techniques to interrogate quantum systems and learn pieces of information that would be difficult for us to extract using traditional methods. So from this perspective, you could view something as, we, something as banal from our perspectives as, uh, say, quantum process tomography as a, for, as a subset of quantum machine learning. All right? And so one of the things, all, though, that I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in is Questions kind of also what Srini is, uh, was talking about during his, his talk, which is really deep down, we live in a quantum mechanical universe, right? And what does that say about what we can learn about things? How much learning power is given to us by quantum examples uh, versus classical examples? Things like this. And this really gives us some insight, not just in machine learning itself, but really what it means to learn inside a quantum mechanical universe. So I think all of these things fit together under the umbrella of quantum machine learning. And so this is now you know, how I'm going to start segueing into my, uh, my stuff, which is talking about the tools that we typically tend to use to solve these problems. So basically, from my perspective, most of the stuff that you end up seeing in, quant in quantum machine learning is a manifestation of three, different, three sort of different types of ideas that are combined together in different ways. And the first one is amplitude amplification, which you know, is basis behind Grover's search and a bunch of different things. And it's used basically in order to do this. Okay, That's, that's all amplitude amplification does. And it's, it, it's, it especially works well for four, four outcomes, but I, 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 I digress. Uh, so <laughs> in any case, the, this ends up often giving quadratic speed ups, doesn't tend to lead to exponential speed ups for problems. The next thing that people end up looking at, and Rolando talked about this previously, um, uh, uh, is to use adiabatic optimization to solve problems. So say what we do is we look at a problem in machine learning that boils down to an optimization problem. What we'd want to do is we'd want to map that problem to an energy uh, minimization problem and then solve this using basically an adiabatic algorithm or an adiabatic-like algorithm and gradually modify the energy, or the Hamiltonian, from one that we can trivially find the, the minimum energy configuration to, to a hard one. And if we do this slowly enough, we get the solution. So that's, that's the heart of a whole bunch of different, different algorithms, and it's provided a lot of inspiration for approaches like the quantum approximate optimization algorithm, uh, or a QAO algorithm. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, the final one, of course, that ends up getting a lot of play in this field is the um, um, linear systems algorithms. These end up getting used over and over again because if you want to solve you know, AX equals B, um, the, these sorts of things end up coming up in training of support vector machines and a number of other problems that are implicitly solved by least squares optimization. So with these three things together, believe it or not, I would say you probably cover 90 to 95% of the, the machine learning literature to some extent. Or quantum machine learning literature, I should say. So that's that's basically it. Now, one of the things, though, that's that's kind of a little bit striking about that list is note I didn't say anything about directly about gradient descent optimization. You'd imagine that something like as fundamental because the first talk was entirely about gradient descent optimization and its importance in machine learning. Yet. Relatively speaking, except for cases where HHL is used implicitly in order to find an optima for, for a function, um, gradient descent isn't explicitly used in most, in most algorithms. And that actually is kind of something that's, that's interesting and, and sparked us to really kind of look at asking why that's the case, especially because there's a well-known algorithm in this space that doesn't seem to get any play.
And so I'll, I'll get to that shortly. But basically, the whole idea of gradient descent is it's a standard optimization algorithm. Really, what you do with gradient descent is gradient descent is a beautiful way for you to be able to find local optima functions. So the idea is, is you start in some sort of an optimization landscape. And depending on whether you want to descend or ascend, um, <laughs> these two lines would go in different directions. But basically, what you do is you start, you drop a random point, say somewhere up here. And then you figure out the slope, and you take steps, discrete steps, down in the direction of steepest descent. And you keep on going, then under relatively um, broad conditions, based on, say, the second derivative of the, of the function, you'll end up converging to a local optima. Now, by local optima, I mean that you know, it's the best one that you can find inside the vicinity over here. It doesn't imply that it's the best one you could ever get. So in practice, what people often will do with the, these sorts of problems is they'll say, OK, what I'll do is I'll you know, start, pick a bunch of random spots. I'll start here, and then maybe I'll start here. And then I'll figure out where the gradient descent algorithm ends up taking us. Then I'll just look at all these solutions and take the minima and hope that the minima over these random restarts is the global optima. Or if it's not the global optima, hope that it's good enough. All right. So this is basically it. And there's many, many, many applications to it, obviously, that, many, that you have seen. One of the applications that's really important in machine learning is uh, training neural networks. So basically, what a neural network is, is a neural network, from my perspective, is like a sledgehammer model for data. Right? What you want to do is you want to be able to build a rich model for any data set, oh, close to any data set that you can feed in, that's capable of modeling a vast array of types of correlations that you could see in the data. And so the standard, the standard feed forward neural net ends up working like this. So you've got a set of input nodes. You can imagine these as just bits, or in a quantum case, qubits, where these bits over here would store the binary version of the, say, image that you're training on, or you know, text, or whatever. And then what you do is you want to be able to Take some image, like say an image of a cat over here, and map this to an output node for the case of a binary classifier. And that binary node will be 0 if it's, if it's not cat, or 1 if it's cat. And these hidden nodes in between are really just, you can view these as latent variables that you trace over in order to build the correlations that you want between the input and the output. So they're not directly needed uh, in some sense if you think about it. But they're absolutely vital in practice for making these algorithms work. Because the way that neural networks end up operating is that you often don't just have a single layer of these hidden units, uh, nodes in here. You'll have, in the case of uh, deep networks, often between 20 uh, to 100 layers operating in, uh, in between, in the middle of those. And the re why, why we do this is to be able to actually end up coming up with increasing abstractions of the data. So you can imagine that, that you've got raw data in the previous layer. This over here would be a learned abstraction that the machine's capable of learning of the data. So the raw, this might be raw data over here. And this could be you know, just simply, like say, nodes that, that detect all the edges or the presence of different types of edges in the graph or in the, the input data. And then the decision would be made on those higher level features, not the raw ones directly. And this idea of creating a hierarchical model where the decisions are based not on the raw data, but on processed versions of the raw data that you end up getting deeper in the network is called deep learning. Right? And the difference between deep and shallow learning from this perspective is really just the number of these hidden uh, units in here. So it's not cool to be shallow. You've always got to be deep, even if your network is really shallow. So that's basically the idea. But the question is, well, how do we do this? How do we actually build the model? Well, the idea is, is that the, the way these models end up working is we have the activations, like a 0 or a 1 over here. And then based on these raw activations, then what we do is we have signals or activation strengths over here that go between 0 and 1 for each of these units that depend on the, all these values that it's connected to at the previous layer. And this is a weighted, these are weighted connections. So all of these have different weights multiplied by it. So some of them might be hugely important for dictating a value. Some of them might be less important. Key point is these weights are not really human provided. What you do is you take the gradient of the, 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 the network's prediction power 
on a set of training vectors that you've taken a look at, and you change these weights in order to optimize how well it ends up performing on a training set. And the way you do that is basically through gradient descent optimization. You, in practice, they'll do it using a fancy form of automatic differentiation called backpropagation, for people who've heard about that, but basically it's gradient descent. All right? And so, you know, in particular, you know, the, the, just to be very clear about that, for the simplest neural network you can envision, you take, you know, say two inputs, x1 and x2, feeding into the input. Then as an output, you get this y over here. And the loss function that we want to minimize would be, say, the square difference between the predictions. Okay? So cool. That is the, the idea behind it. So to give you an example of this, something that's very easy to quantify, uh, quantize and something that, you know, I think is, is a neural network that, you can, that physicists can really understand. Uh, let me talk about deep Boltzmann machines. So basically, Boltzmann machines are a class of uh, what's called recurrent neural network, which means rather than a signal going one way, there can be loops back on itself. And the idea basically is that what you have in a Boltzmann machine is that this graph over here, you can actually view as a Hamiltonian. So the idea is the neural network over here actually corresponds to an easing model over uh, a set of qubits. So all these neurons over here in neural net language now become qubits. The in interaction strengths between, between each of these nodes, the weights, are just you know, the ZZ terms in the easing Hamiltonian. And what you want to be able to do with this model is you want to be able to figure out the weights that maximize the probability of the easing model generating the training data that it was trained with. Okay? And so an example of what, what you can do with this is you can do something like the following. You put, if you have, this Boltzmann machine was trained by Hinton and uh, uh, Salakudinov, and they, you know, they seeded it with a bunch of these images of different toys, right? The Boltzmann machine was trained with these, and then these examples over here are where what it thought were typical examples of the things that it was trained with. So you can actually get these models to sort of dream new images based on the ones that it was trained. And you can see it's got actually pretty high fidelity, and none of these examples that you have over here precisely correspond to the ones that were, were seen over there. All right? So, yeah? So you train these machines with label data, saying that this toy is, nope. the name is this, and then ask it to dream that name? Or? No, no. You, you can do it that way. But for this particular case, it wasn't done in a supervised fashion. So in this case, these raw images were just provided to it. And then it was told, OK, you know, dream up something. And these are examples of what it, what it came up with. So what are you optimizing then? So what you're optimizing here, is specifically, is this. So what you're, uh, what you're optimizing is the log likelihood of it generating uh, the, the configurations that were seen in a training set. Okay. And in this case, it turns out to be really convenient because uh, one of the really nice things is that because this is an easing model in thermal equilibrium that gives you the probability, the probability comes in like an exponential. And if there's one function that logarithms play really nicely with, it's exponentials. So the fact that you can take this probability distribution and compute the logarithm allows you to actually, despite computational problems, um, give you explicit forms for the, the gradient. And so that's what the thing that's beautiful about this model is that you have an explicit gradient that you can compute. But you still got to compute the gradient by, by a sampling. This is expensive, and this is one of the reasons why people don't tend to use this model too much in practice. It requires a lot of Gibbs sampling and many, many repetitions in order to be able to get the gradients of each of the terms in the Hamiltonian that you're using in order to simulate your examples. All right? And so that is basically it. We, uh, crude approximations are used to it, and it sucks. So there's other areas, though, in quantum where a, gradi a gradient descent is used. And this one area, variational eigensolvers, it's also you know, often called QAOA. But the idea is totally identical. And so the idea basically behind these, these approaches is what you want to be able to do is, say, find the ground state energy of a Hamiltonian. So the way that you do it is you basically say, OK, I'm going to come up with some parameterized uh, onsets over here with a bunch of parameters x1 through xd. right? And then what I want to do is the ground state energy for, for a system is guaranteed to be the, uh, the minimum uh, energy that you could possibly get over all states in there. 
So what you do is you basically just fix an onslaught state. You vary over all those parameters in it in order to find the minimum energy for the, the Hamiltonian. And so that, this is done in practice in most of the experiments that, that have been done. Uh, like I think this is one that came from the Google group. Is, uh, uh, it typically will end up using VQE because based on current uh, coherence uh, limits that people have in devices, uh, naive applications of phase estimation tends, tend to actually work worse than these onsatses that people, people use. So that's, that's basically the idea behind it. But in order to find the optimum state over here, what typically is used is some variant of gradient descent. In practice, they'll often use great, technically gradient-free methods, but spiritually it's the same idea. All right. So that's it. Another example behind this is the, uh, this idea called an autoencoder. And so autoencoders, they're, they're really kind of cool. They're a type of neural network that has the following form. So what you do is you begin with, say, a big image like this cat over here. And by the way, in practice, you probably would need more than three neurons in between. But this, this captures the idea. So the idea basically is what you want to do is you want to be able to compress the data that's needed in order to represent this concept of a cat by training this neural network on a set of images, like different types of cats. And then what you'd like to do is you'd like to build a cat compressor out of this, which sounds like a very cruel <laughs> thing, but I, I, I swear no animals were harmed. Um, but the way that you do this is you take the input image over here, and then you train the neural network so that it compresses this input image to be all the data, for all of the data to be stored on just these three neurons in the middle. And then this, this part of the neural network decompresses it back out. And ideally, what you want to do is you want to be able to generate the same input image that you fed in with minimal loss. OK? So that's the whole idea behind it. And if you've seen these images from Google Deep Dream with, um, that are like you know, starry night with uh, sea life in the back, background, it's basically th these types of systems that are used to generate it. Okay, so that's the idea behind it, and the way that these are solved is uh, by using a uh, gradient descent. Okay, cool. So I'm going to talk about quantum ver uh, applications for all of those different things. So I'm going to say, how can we use quantum versions of gradient descent in order to do better for all of these different types of problems? And but in order to do this, I really have to make sure that I'm 100% crystal clear about what exactly I mean by uh, having a quantum solution to gradient descent. Because say you're taking a look at an example like uh, the quantum linear systems algorithm, right? With a quantum linear systems algorithm, you sort of solve AX equals B, but you, you kind of don't. Because you get the solution output as a quantum state, right? And that doesn't actually tell you, unless you use tomography, what the gradient really, or sorry, what the uh, solution actually really is. So what I mean here by uh, quantum gradient descent is I want to be able to have some sort of uh, function uh, over here that is uh, real valued but takes d inputs and I want to be able to take it uh, compute the fun of the gradient in, in the following way. I start with the value I want to compute the gradient at, I have some ancillary register and then I store the entire gradient vector in binary form in an additional register. Okay, So in this sense it's a very very strong notion of uh, computing the gradient. It legitimately is right there for you to learn. You do not need to use tomography there is, the information is not in a superposition of states. It's there. But of course, this comes with a major drawback. If you want to use this on short-term computers, and you want to get an improvement in terms of the scaling with, uh, with D up here, then you're going to need a huge register down at the bottom in order to compensate for it. Okay? So that's one of the caveats that I wanted to mention for this. But nonetheless, our goal is to say, can we get improved scaling for this form of gradient calculation? Why do you think it's a norm? That's a relevant one for machine learning. And like I'm sorry, what? What's the relevant norm? Why are you using computing the error in infinity norm? Um, well, the infinity norm is, is actually the reason why I'm computing it in terms of the infinity norm is that was what Stephen Jordan did with his uh, first version of the algorithm. That's a good answer. But in terms of gradient <laughs> descent, that's like a um, that's good or? I don't or think so. I think, that, I think that when you use the infinity norm, you're kind of hiding dimensionful quantities. Because if you're constant distance away in the infinity norm as your dimension increases, then you can just be totally garbage. So um, our results are computed with respect to the infinity norm. But we spend a lot of time in our paper talking about you know, why you should really be concerned and skeptical about infinity norm results here. Oh, okay.
so, so what is the situation if we wanted a two norm or one norm? Oh, you just anything known about it? Norm inequalities. That's all you do. Uh, well, wait. You're, you're saying that there's nothing better than that? Um, like, like there's nothing better than what follows from standard norm inequalities. Not unless you make assumptions. Is, yeah. And then there's a lower bound to show that. Yep. That exa exactly it. Yeah. So. All right. But so basically, okay. Let me. Take a step back. This problem has al al already has you know one form of a solution to it that's uh, that's been given in the literature for years by Stephen Jordan, right? And the idea the idea behind his algorithm is actually pretty cute. The idea behind it basically is what you want to do is you want to be able to compute the gradient in this form using a quantum Fourier transform. And so the idea is is that if you take a look at evaluating a function at some point over here, we can imagine expanding it. Um, um, expanding it to leading order uh, using a Taylor series expansion in the, this form up here. Okay, and so the idea is is that imagine your function were constant, right? And you had the following algorithm: you compute the Fourier transform over this, you apply the constant function, then at every point along here it's going to be the same value. If you uncompute the Fourier transform, nothing's going to happen, right? If there's any change though that ends up happening, that change is going to be sensitive to this first derivative over here. And so that's why the algorithm, which works by literally Fourier transforming, applying the function in phase to each of the inputs, then un-Fourier transforming, uh, ends up giving you effectively the gradient. I mean, isn't this really just a disguised version of bernstein Bazarani? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so basically, again, you know, in a, in a, with a little more, little more detail, um, how, how this, end, this ends up working is, yeah, we begin by discretizing our space into a series of uh, time slices. Then what we do is we um, simply Fourier transform over here, inverse, and we get the result. And yeah, just like bernstein Vazirani, you get the result directly out as a bit string. Awesome. OK, so that's the idea basically be behind the, uh, the algorithm. And so, OK, why doesn't everybody use it? Because I mentioned those, those three algorithms that everybody talks about beforehand. There's a couple of good reasons why Jordan's algorithm for gradient doesn't show up. Um, basically, what you need to be able to do is, in order to evaluate this, you need to be able to estimate um, this. Uh, you need to be able to apply the phases corresponding to the function very accurately. Problem is, is that for most of these applications that I was talking about, like let's say we're talking about QAOA over here, or variational eigensolvers equivalently. What you have over here is if you wanted to do that, you'd have to get a quantum subroutine that would end up giving you an approximation to that expectation value. That'll usually come in as an amplitude, right? And if you consider the, the challenge in doing the phase estimation in order to be able to put it forward, you, lose, uh, you, you typically will end up losing the benefits that you end up getting out of it, because you need a very high accuracy in order to be able to do it with this. Um, and so if you've got an efficient function that you want to evaluate and compute the gradients for it, especially like a polynomial, it's pretty straightforward. Problem is, is that many of these other applications that I talked about don't naturally fit this form. So that's one of the reasons why this, this uh, isn't used. And in some of the most extreme cases, you end up finding that the naive gradient descent uh, classical algorithm ends up giving better scaling than Jordan's algorithm for those problems. So our objective was to look at, look at this take inspiration from Jordan's algorithm, and see if we can do better. And also figure out whether or not the, the uh, algorithm is optimal. And uh, spoiler alert, yeah, it is. Um, so, OK, so how do we end up doing this? So first thing that I want to talk about is what our input model is here, which differs a little bit from uh, Jordan's phase oracle version of it. So what we end up assuming is we end up assuming that the input to our problem is specified in the following form. We're given some maximum value that the function ends up taking over the, the interval. And the value that the function ends up uh, attaining at a particular point is given by this amplitude over here. Okay? So it starts looking kind of like you know, the, um, that correction step that Rolando showed in the last talk for HHL. Right? We have the, the answer stored as an amplitude kind of off to the side over here. And then basically what we do in order to be able to map this forward to, um, to a form where that we can use the, 
All right, sorry. Basically, what we want to do is we want to be able to interconvert an oracle that computes the answer as an amplitude to one that's able to kick it back as a phase. Because we need to kick it back as a phase in order to take advantage of the quantum Fourier transform for this. Do you have some independent motivation for this oracle model? Or is it oh, yeah. So the independent motivation behind it basically is like QAOA. So in those cases, if we wanted to be able to take a look at the you know, expectation value of some function, right, we would naturally have some circuit that ends up giving the expectation value in that form. Okay? So that's basically it. So uh, that's why we wanted to do it uh, like this. And also, it, this way, it's, um, yeah, it's a little less obscure because of the fact that Jordan's method it makes it look like in some ways you can get away with a single oracle query, but there's some stuff that's kind of been sweep, swept under the rug in order to do it. But, it, but under his assumptions, you can, right? Under his assumptions, you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a very powerful oracle that yeah. he ends up assuming. Well, it computes that. Yeah, computes yeah. that. <laughs> All right. And so the idea basically, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a little more detail later on, is that we show that there's actually really efficient methods that can be used in order to interconvert between the two. Uh, what we do is we, for, in our case, we use linear combinations of unitaries in order to be able to do a spectral transformation between the two. But um, basically, uh, this could also be done using block encoding techniques that have been developed since then. And so, again, you know, this is important because, as I was me mentioning just a second ago to Scott, you know, there's problems. Like, in particular, we're going to examine, you know, this VQE problem as well as training autoencoders. And both of these fit beautifully into this amplitude framework that we, we put forward for our oracles. All right. And so just to give, uh, so if you, if you fall asleep for the rest of the talk, you know, these are, these are sort of the important things before you go back to checking your email. So basically, um, if we take a look at the, the improvements in the scaling, um, there's a bunch of different symbols that end up coming in over here. Um, if t, let t be the number of gradient steps taken. Uh, in this case, um, we don't improve our scaling at all with the number of gradient steps that you need. So, because our job is really just to give you the, uh, uh, the best algorithm that you can get for computing the gradient. How you use those gradient steps, we don't improve. We'd like to be able to use quantum to improve that, but we don't know how at the moment. Okay, so that scaling is constant. The next scaling that we consider is, remember how I said that you know, if you want to try to find the global optima, you want to do a bunch of restarts? Right? And so, you know, if you do it naively, if you want to do n restarts, you've got to do it n times. But you can, uh, we call it Grover search, but it's really Dirhoyer optimization that we use in order to find the best of all these n random restarts in quadratically less time. Then, finally, uh, the improvement in the scaling with d. The naive algorithm scales linearly with d, but by using our method, we can get square root scaling with d. Fun thing, fun fact, the square root improvement is not from Grover search. Normally, when you see a square root improvement like this, especially in quantum machine learning, you expect it to be an amplitude amplification improvement, kind of like we end up getting for this n to square root n. But this d to square root d is not from that at all. It's actually from the use of uh, um, exploiting the quantum Fourier transform as well as high order difference formulas. So, the, uh, and then finally, of course, this one over. So, so because of Grover, is this square root? Is he the best we can do, or it's just... Yeah, that was, that was one of the questions we naturally asked ourselves as soon as we saw that, right? Because it right. wasn't clear that it, was, that it was optimal. So we came up with two arguments. The first one was a uh, state discrimination lower bound that showed that it was optimal. Mm -hmm. And then we were able to get a hybrid bound argument that was a little bit, had better assumptions on the form of the function that we can take. So what we can say is we can say that this is optimal if we end up assuming that basically the repeated derivatives grow basically no faster than k to the k. So you know, there's that, that covers a large range of functions, and that, that most, so most smooth functions are going to satisfy that. But in principle, yeah, for highly non-smooth functions, these methods may not necessarily be optimal. But so that's that's the Coles Notes version of it. Um, the uh, other the other thing is that when we translate Jordan's Jordan's sort of original method over into sort of our our viewpoint, one of the things that's, that's, that's interesting about it is that if we actually take a look at it, depending on the type of approximation, and this is going to Fernando's question, if, if we want an epsilon approximation in terms of the infinity norm over here, and we constrain ourselves to the types of oracles that we've used over here, then Jordan's method ends up you know, giving like a square root d over epsilon squared scaling, which you know, 
um, doesn't seem all that bad. But when we actually t convert that to an uh, epsilon scaling in the infinity norm, we end up getting a dramatically worse scaling over here than we would get. In fact, actually, it's worse scaling than um, the sort of semi-classical method where we just use amplitude amplification on top of everything. So that's one of the reasons why you know, it's, uh, uh, we, we like our stuff. So let me give you a, a little bit, this, because this part is pretty easy to explain, let me give you some intuition behind how the uh, amplitude uh, to phase conversion ends up happening. So the key idea behind this is that there's this beautiful, wonderful algorithm that already exists for converting between probabilities and phase. It's, it's Grover's algorithm. So if you use amplitude amplification, one of the things to note is that if you amplify on two values, you end up getting eigenvalues that are of the form, you know, uh, arc sine of square root p. Okay? So the idea basically is what we do is we have a, if we have a coherent method that's capable of preparing some state that has some probability p on a good branch and a bad branch, and you know, one minus p on the other one, then what we can do is we can run Grover's, sorry, we can run amplitude amplification on the good branch in order to generate a, a, a unitary that has eigenvalues of this form. And so then what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to map the spectrum from the, ampli uh, from the amplitude amplification circuit to a new unitary that just has eigenvalues e to the i p, where p is the probability, which I remind you is the rescaled function value in this case. So the way that we, um, uh, oh, OK. I should have actually talked about that differently. But in any case, the idea behind, behind this improved uh, gradient descent calculation um, uh, part of the speed up basically ends up coming in from the following. You know, if we're computing the gradient at each of these individual steps and kicking back the phase over here in order to be able to find the values, what we need to do is we need to be able to find the, uh, uh, a good estimate of the derivative. And so the way that we end up doing this is, you know, the simplest way, which is basically the way that Jordan does it in his paper, is he, more, he uses a forward difference formula. So he just says, you know, the derivative is f of x plus h minus f of x over h, right? And there's errors that depend on the second derivative over here. And so this isn't the only thing you can use. You can also use a centered difference formula. If you use a centered difference formula, now it goes like h cubed. But in general, you can use higher order formulas, and uh, we show a result that uh, for high order uh, 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 derivative formulas ends up giving us scaling that goes like um, h to the uh, 2m plus 1 for any m we feel like. All right? So that's, that's one of the key tricks that we end up using. So oh, that was weird. OK, the slide must have been gotten in out of order. Um, but yeah, since I've got 10 minutes, um, the way that we end up implementing the uh, final linear uh, com uh, uh, combinations of unitaries in order to be able to do the spectral transformation is um, we just end up finding a Fourier series, like Rolando ended up doing. And then from the Fourier series, we uh, end up converting with polylog error using uh, oblivious amplitude amplification. And the way linear combinations can be implemented, as also seen in Rolando's talk, is that they basically involve using a, an elementary circuit that looks like the following. You use a control register up at the top, you do a transformation on it, and then based on the values in the control register, you apply selectively one of any number of operators. I've done it here for two. But in this case where you've got two, what you end up with is you end up with two branches. One where you have u plus v, another one where you have u minus v. And so the idea basically is that if you have a, a, a case where you can represent the operator you want as a sum, of different unitaries, you can use this circuit in order to operationalize it. And as we did over here, this conversion, we, we found a way to write a Fourier series for it, so we could write it as a sum of unitaries. We stick it into this over here, we run it, and then we use a technique uh, that uh, uh, Andrew, and, uh, Andrew Rolando and others invented uh, called oblivious amplitude amplification that can be used to essentially make this probability 100%. So that's basically how that ends up going. Um, so the, the way the algorithm ends up working, again, at an extremely high level is that we start making a bunch of random restarts. We repeat the algorithm, the gradient descent uh, calculation t times for the number of steps that we end up taking. We create, uh, apply the QFT to create a superposition over all values that we make the function at. We use a high order uh, derivative formula 
do the inverse, take the gradient, step, and then der Hoyer over all of these. Putting all of these things together, we end up getting that. And so there's a couple of caveats that end up going in. As I said before, we end up assuming that our function along the way is uh, analytic. We also end up uh, assuming that um, the derivatives are upper bounded by this over here for convenience. If we end up doing that, then we end up getting the following scaling down over here uh, with high probability. We suppressed the, the probability in most of the previous ones, but basically we can make the probability as, uh, as high as you want at logarithmic cost. So the uh, other thing that's <coughs> worth mentioning over here is that all of this again is uh, based on the uh, high order derivative formulas and we end up showing the, some results on this saying that with very high probability over the input values, these high order formulas are going to end up giving us some very small error over here that we can bound as a geometric series. Um, the interesting thing is this factor of one over a thousand over here. That actually ends up coming from the fact that having a uniform bound on the air for this that was tight enough to saturate our lower bounds was challenging. So what we ended up doing is we used Chebyshev's inequality in order to be able to turn this into a probabilistic bound. And then we boosted the probabilistic bound by random sampling and taking a median. And then once we uh, do that, throw in uh, uh, some triangle inequality, use uh, Sterling's inequality to be, or uh, Sterling's formula to deal with the factorials that show up in a Taylor series expansion, we end up getting that funky formula. But it's a straightforward calculation. Um, as I said before, I'm pretty much running out of time, but the lower bound is relatively straightforward. Um, it says that under this assumption that we have this over here, uh, we can't get the, this below square root d over epsilon according to a hybrid bound, uh, method argument. And in fact, we can actually end up giving a counterexample, uh, also just for pedagogical reasons, that uh, of a function that has derivatives that are higher than this and ends up uh, um, uh, violating this. So, okay, cool. So now let me talk about some examples of how, where this algorithm could be applied in practice. So the prototypical pro sort of problem that we would like to look at is this problem of a tunable unitary circuit. So the idea is imagine you've got this case over here where you've got a uh, unitary that's say a function of these three different angles, which you, know, you can imagine as being like Euler angles or something that parameterizes your circuit. And what you want to do over here is you want to be able to uh, create some ideal state or some ideal distribution on the other hand. And your goal then is to modify these values over here in order to optimize it. There's two different, sort, there's different ways that we can end up doing this. You know, some of these algorithms over here, they can be decomposed into a tuned part of the circuit, an initial prep part of the circuit that doesn't depend on the tuned parameters over here, and then some part that actually ends up executing the algorithm. Um, this tuned part, in, for most of the cases that people have looked at, is classically controlled, but here we're going to consider it to be quantumly controlled. All right. So the variational eigensolver uh, result, it can be mapped directly to this, this framework. Um, the, the way that we end up doing this is we end up using uh, linear combinations of unitaries ideas in order to be able to sum all of the unitaries in a decomposition of the Hamiltonian and use that in order to be able to compute the expectation value and output it as an amplitude. All right? So it fits exactly into this framework. This box over here is the V that we have over there. This is the tuned part that ends up setting the state prep and this prep is actually kind of trivial in this case. And if we end up doing this, we can actually show that we can um, compute the gradient with this in, uh, in a time that scales like square root d over epsilon, where again, epsilon is the error in the infinity norm, not the uh, two norm. But the key point is, is that this uh, is uh, better than uh, the best known approaches that people end up doing uh, before, where it typically ends up scaling like you know, um, md squared, if we take a look at these problems. And d can be quite large for variational ansatzes, you know, 10,000 or greater. So there's potentially speed ups uh, for this, for these types of applications in chemistry or in machine learning uh, when we, um, if we were to use these techniques on large scale problems on a quantum computer. Although at a price of requiring a lot of memory in order to be able to store the gradients. Okay. Similarly, we can, do, uh, uh, we can use this in order to improve variational autoencoders. And the idea of a variational autoencoder is that we have these a tuned encoder circuit over here and we have a decoder circuit which correspond kind of schematically 
to this half for, the auto for an autoencoder and that half of an autoencoder. Only difference is rather than a feed-forward classical neural network, now we've got a programmable quantum circuit. All right. And so what we want to do is we this oh, it can be this can be mapped over here, and then we get actually O tilde square root d over epsilon for exactly the same reasons, because we can map this type of circuit to the same template that we saw before. And so as a result, we can also do variational autoencoders faster than anybody knew that, that they could in the past. Um, also, we can use this in order to uh, improve uh, QAOA examples like this work that I did with uh, Alex Bokharov and Maria Schuld, where they take a uh, programmable circuit of a particular form and use this to train a data set and, you know, in this case, uh, outperform most uh, naive classifiers for a typical set of uh, uh, ML problems. And in this case, what we end up getting is we end up getting order square root descaling, just like we did for all the other cases. So we can use this also for other practical examples of quantum machine learning problems. So basically, to conclude, there's a bunch of things that uh, we, we come up with, uh, I think, conceptual improvements on Jordan's algorithm, uh, and as well as practical improvements, especially in the case where the data isn't given by a single query to like a binary oracle, where you get your data coming in as a, um, uh, in terms of amplitudes, like you do for many quantum machine learning problems. Um, but there's a number of things that I think really I, I, I'd like to look at and I'd like other people to take a look at too. One deficiency of this algorithm is that this algorithm really is just an ordinary gradient descent algorithm. We cannot take advantage of he the Hessian when it comes to this. Naive methods to try to compute the Hessian, we looked at that, but it was computationally extremely expensive and it required a huge amount of memory. Maybe some of the ideas like the, from the first talk that we heard on, on Monday might be actually give ways that we can implicitly compute the Hessian in order to be able to do quantum gradient descent better. Another question is, well, what about the stepping process in gradient descent? Here, we don't actually do the steps any smarter than a classical algorithm does. Is there any way that quantum computers can get an advantage over that part of the algorithm? That's something we also don't know. A final thing that I think is very interesting is that what we really want for most machine learning applications is we don't want the actual gradient output as a state. What we really want is to do something like stochastic gradient descent. We want to be able to get some variables that we can sample from and estimate the gradient from those statistical samples. And the reason that if we could pull off a way to get that same scaling or similar scaling uh, to what we're seeing here, but give a stochastic gradient coming back out in this form, that would be really nice because then we wouldn't have to have all of these qubits around in order to be able to store the gradient as, a, as an output. So all of these things I think are, are, are a great step forward. So even though we manage to saturate lower bounds under reasonable assumptions about the smoothness of the function, I think there's a lot more to be explored uh, in uh, quantum gradient descent. And I, I really hope that it doesn't take you know, another 12 years for people to be able to solve these uh, remaining problems. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. If it's if it's if it's exponential, then um, we could then then that's ins that's insufficient. Uh, so we can find uh, we can find examples where um, yeah where we can do better than our performance. Oh, sorry. If it's just exponential, no, I got it backwards. If it's just exponential, then you're great. Then it falls under our assumptions because exponential is inside k to the k, <laughs> right? So our, all of our I mean, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, I see what you're getting at. Um, I don't know if you would do better if you just uh, restricted yourself to that. Um, that's a good question. Srini, do you have any intuition? I don't think so. Yeah. I think there's some follow-up that says that if it's just exponential, it needs to have a lower bottom line. Okay. Yeah. So I have a question. So yeah. if, if, you want, if I want the two norm, um, is, there, is there a lower bound that tells me that even for the two norm, the best thing I can do is, you know, run the infinity norm algorithm and then apply a norm inequality and pay at the sure. approximation. Well, I think that you know, in general, the answer is no. Uh, 
because of the fact that if your um, the the norm inequalities that you end up using between the two are are, are tight for some instances. But if you, the question is, if you restrict yourself to instances that uh, for which that that isn't tight, I don't know. So so it's optimal, you know, like in general, but maybe not optimal on an instance by instance basis. Exactly. That's yeah. So any. question. So, uh, so these algorithms, I guess, for, for RD, do they work, or do similar algorithms work for other spaces, like, like differentiable manifolds or things like this, hmm. for computing gradient type? I haven't thought about that. Yeah, I, I, I really don't know. Um, the, I suppose in any case where the central, the central intuition ends up working where you can do something kind of like a Fourier transform and you've got this strong notion of continuity. Like a group or something. Yeah, it might, there, there, there's some hope. But, you know, I, one of the things that I, I, again, worry about is that if you, you know, for some of the discrete cases that I, we, I briefly looked at, there really isn't much hope because there isn't enough continuity. That's a, you know, it's. I mean, I see two Hadamards in a row. I know, I know, right? Not optimized. No. Yeah, yeah.